You are welcome back to Transformation Time with the Samaritan Strategy. For the past weeks, we've been talking on issues concerning discipling nations. That has to do with the individual, you and I. And so we started talking about the gates of the city. And we did say that you are a gate, a very special person representing God's agenda within your life, within your organization, within your workplace, within your business, within your family. You are a gate. And after we were done with that, we came to the forest that many people would think they are hopeless. They are not capable. They are not worth anything. And for many, Life is not worth living. But we, through that topic, forest in the seed, try to inform you that you are not just an individual created in Christ Jesus for nothing. You are special. You are unique. And you are a forest in a seed. If you don't right now, people see you. As a seed. Sometimes. They don't even recognize. Your worth. Your importance. How valuable you are. But before God. You are so critical. You are. A forest. In a seed. Let's step out. Let's turn out. As people. Created in the image of God. People who are representatives and ambassadors of Christ Jesus. Wherever we are, let's step out and let all see the beauty, the glory, the goodness of God in us that in all our actions and behaviors and conduct, Christ will be glorified. Today I want to speak on the topic business as a mission. As children of God, discipled in the likeness of Christ, as his representatives and ambassadors, we are involved in various activities, programs, and professions. But how do you see our work? Do you see it as a secular work, a secular job, secular business, something that has to do with the world? Or do you see your work? as a mission. We are people to represent God's agenda wherever we find ourselves. So in whatever we are involved in, we are in a mission field. God places us where we should be for his intentions and only for his glory. So you are not where in your family workplace, in your profession, in your business, as uh, by chance. But you are where you are to represent his agenda. And if that is your mind and heart, then you are on a mission. A mission to glorify God. A mission to bring about his full intentions. A mission for people to know the God we serve. And that's why we talk about business as a mission. Normally we talk about business for mission, business in mission, business or mission. Now business as mission is being God's like to be creative and create good things also in and through business. Now business as mission also is being Christ-like to meet the needs around us, demonstrating God's kingdom 
in the marketplace and thus glorify the king in whose service we find ourselves. Business as mission, being true to our calling to be salt and light in the business world among the poor and where the name of Jesus is really heard. Business as mission is an attempt to respond to God's mission, to the creation mandate and the great commission. Unfortunately, we have what you call the Greek dichotomy or dualism, where people have divided their lives into two. Some people see some aspects of their lives as being in a higher calling or more important than other places. For some, Sunday is the lost day. Of course, we do know how Sunday became the lost day. But how about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Is it for Satan or is it for the world? So, People who see Sunday as a higher call or a higher or more important day would put all their spirituality, their spiritual life, spiritual worship on Sunday. A day of grace. And so for such people, they are called Sunday to be more important than other, other days of the week. But we want to say that the God of Sunday is also the God of Monday. He is also the God of Wednesday, the God of Thursday, and the God of Saturday. But this Greek dichotomy or dualism, you see, I've made people to think if you are involved in a particular ministry or in a particular work, like priest, pastor, evangelist, someone who is an apostle, a bishop, a missionary, then you are involved in a higher or more important call. And so, until recently, in Bible schools and seminaries, the topics that are treated with this sort of mentality are topics like faith, theology, ethics, missions, devotional life, and the gospel. On the other hand, from Monday to Saturday, people see it as ordinary day or less important days where spiritual exercise is done. So, that is where people do the natural things, the physical, the secular things. And so, people who go to public universities or to colleges that do not call themselves seminary or theological schools are not considered as schools that have that Monday to teach spiritual, I mean, courses, so-called. So where people read courses like philosophy, reason, science, business, economics, politics, arts and music, the physical sciences, bread, these are not, to some people, spiritual courses. They see this as carnal, secular, or worldly courses. In it, the gospel journey begins with salvation, but must not end there. The gospel begins with creation, not the cross. Even though the cross is the center, the central uh, mandate that people see themselves. Cross is central. It is in the context of creation. So even though the cross is central, the cross is not or the gospel. And that's why we need to understand the gospel from Genesis to Revelation. When you look at the man Adam, we see the stewardship mandate from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, 
and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, this is the stewardship bandit where God places man to rule over all things that are created. Man was to steward cre creation for the glory of God. Man was to fill the earth and subdue it. Man was to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature. Now that's interesting for us in Africa where in most cases rivers are considered as gods. Rivers are not just physical. People see the spirits inhabiting rivers. So in, there are some places where even the fish in a river cannot be consumed because they are perceived as spirits incarnate. And we, in most cases, are helpless in dealing with creation. The very creation God meant for us to rule, to subdue, to dominate. Things like trees, mountains, stones. When you come to Africa, in some places, these creation, creation things or created things dominate, rule people's life. And they are considered as gods, spirits that rule, that dominate people's life. We have to get a biblical understanding of how God has placed you as his child to rule over all of this, that you can see whatever business you find yourself as being in the business of the God who called you to himself. So what is business? Business for us is a mission, a calling, a ministry in its own right. A human activity reflecting our divine origin being created to be creative, to create good things by good processes for us to enjoy with others. It's very important for us to get that understanding right. So business as a mission of stewardship. Economic activity is rooted in the creation story. Business and enterprise form the institution that is designed to create and sustain wealth for a just society. In the same way, government is designed to create and sustain an organized society and the family is designed to create and sustain well-adjusted individuals. The biblical idea of stewardship encompasses humankind's care of creation. It also deals with the responsibility of personal stewardship of talents and worth. Even as we saw it last week, when we talk about you are a forest in the seed. Good personal stewardship calls us to move away from a selfish focus on accumulation and towards a life of selfless generosity. Are we more spiritual than God? I think six days of creation after each day was so important for us to take note. God evaluated all that he has created after six days. And what was the evaluation? It was good. When we read John 3, 16, the Bible clearly says that, for God so love the world. Now that is the God we serve. 
Are we more spiritual than God? When we do quotes, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For anyone who loves the world, God's love is not in him. I mean, do we, are we sincere with that quotation? When we refer that to things we perceive to be secular things, or is it talking about the real uh, motives, our selfishness, our greed, our materialistic tendencies, the God that, our, I mean, the creation that our God created, He loves His creation. Because poverty is fundamentally relational, the twin goals of transformation, development, I change people and just and peaceful relationship. By change people, I mean people who have discovered their true identity as human beings, made in the image of God, and to discover our true vocation as productive stewards, faithfully caring for the world and all the people in it. Many today hold the traditional mission paradigm as sacred because it is the ultimate demonstration of devotional life if you are a missionary in a remote part of the world. You must have all the ultimate sacrifice or you made all the ultimate sacrifice and your entire life is given to the spiritual pursuit of God and the proclamation of the gospel. However, when I read about many pioneer missionaries, most believe in a holistic approach and made incredible strides to bring about economic development to the communities where they served. At some point, the shift was made and those who were sent to the field only had the background of a Bible school instead of any other kind of work skills. And that instilled into the life of the new convert that the most spiritual were not in the business world, but rather were full-time professional Christians. So the missionary is most respected, the pastor, second, caring profession like teacher, social worker, medical profession was third in line, business, engineering, computer, IT professionals were mostly considered as people in the world. Why Jesus shed his blood? When you look at Colossians, chapter 1, verse 50 to 20, I read, He is the image of the invincible God, the first over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, and on earth, visible and invincible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. In the, uh, verse 20 of Colossians 1. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Why? Jesus shed his blood to reconcile to himself all things. Daru Miller, my mentor says, the biblical worldview provides and paying wages year after year. 
Therefore, if we are ever going to see that most of the population, while European missionaries had so little effect, they answered that the Europeans came as missionaries, acted like missionaries, and only left the mission compound to do evangelistic raids into the countryside. The Muslims, on the other hand, in stark contrast, were not missionaries, but rather traders and business people who lived among the nations, held commerce with them, and in the course of their enterprise, shared the truth of Islam. So go to a country like Sierra Leone, where the British missionary activity started across West Africa. That was the base. Sierra Leone was a country where the British mission agencies took missionary activities across the English-speaking uh, region of West Africa. This country is almost taken over by Muslims. Why? Because while the, the Christian missionaries were located in, in, in places isolated from the community. They build themselves places of seclusion. Salems kept them from people of the so-called world. And we're doing just as described here, evangelistic raids to the communities. The Muslims came, settled with them, worked with them, live among them, traded with them, shared the truth of Islam. Most of our nations have been taken over by Islam. And people can just pray about it. They are so strategic. We can even do better. But where we think business is secular, business is something Christians must shun from, and then be involved in Christian programs and activities. Then, how do we evangelize people who are living in hunger and poverty and deprivations? It is time for us to fulfill what Jesus said even in Matthew 1, 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David the son of Abraham and God to Abraham through you all nations will be blessed the great commission again here we see the son of David the son of Abraham has come and what is the mandate to us then Jesus said in Matthew 28 18 to 20 Jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The great omission, not the great commission, the great omission is that we must remember when Jesus set up the great commission, he did not actually say go, but rather, as you are in the process of going, this construction implies that as you are in the process of your normal business life, disciple the nation. It is true that a fully devoted business person has time constraints. But then, so do the people they are seeking to influence. So, we have to quadruple the bottom line. We know Henry Ford once said, a business that only makes money is a poor kind of business. Most businesses exist solely 
to make a profit for their shareholders. That is the financial bottom line. Business as a mission looks beyond that to, to the quadruple bottom line. It is financial, it is also social, it is spiritual, and it brings also environmental returns. We have to, the tax before us is quite challenging. It includes the need for jobs, new business setup, venture capital, business know-how. We have to access to markets and business ethics. This transformational development is enormous. We are deceiving ourselves if we believe that just drawing on the same resource will make a major difference. No. The world needs a new kind of Christian worker. Maybe a vision, a, a visionary, a person or a busy person with a sense of calling equipped for service in the marketplace for the greater glory of God. God is calling professionals to explore how to serve him through the expanding business as mission movement. The difference is that God has gifted some people with the resources of mind and spirit to be businessmen and women. Business as mission seeks to support and encourage those who are gifted by God in this way. It aims to stimulate interest and commitment to doing business as unto the Lord. It desires, it desires to assist business people to see the opportunities that exist to use that, their skill and talents to bless those in the poorest and most needy part of the world and to provide in those contests credible opportunities to demonstrate and proclaim Christ. I warmly support this endeavor in the global think tank, recalling that in the earliest history of the Christian mission, the saving news of Christ was often carried to new places by those who were seeking to do business. Harry Goodshill, a retired Anglican Bishop of Sydney, said this. I fully agree. It is time for us to look at what we do as Christian people in business. Business should not be seen in the secular context. Business should not be regarded as worldly. Jesus, the story of the talents, one giving five, the other giving two, the other giving one. The instruction given to the servant was that go do business. Sometimes I think we appear to be more spiritual than God. But we cannot. We can just be more and more like Jesus Christ. The call is on us now, beloved, to stand out. The Bible says, whatever your hand find it to do, do it as unto the Lord. Colossians 3, 23-24 Whatever our hand find it to do. What is your what has your hand find need to do? Is it carpentry? Is it masonry? Is it law profession? Is it banking? Is it governance? What and where do you find your, yourself? In the marketplace or in an office? As secretary, IT specialist, as an entrepreneur or as a mother, or engineer, as a teacher, or health worker, where do you find yourself? You are placed where you are, by God, to glorify his name. 
If you are a student, you learn hard as unto the Lord. If you are a worker, you work hard as unto the Lord. We need a new paradigm shift, a new mindset where God is glorified in whatever we do. We are missionaries. Missionaries not only in what people perceive as mission field outside their countries and outside their homes. We are missionaries in accounting. We are missionaries in politics. We are missionaries in the professions God has called. We are missionaries in, in politics. Wherever you are, if you are a child of God, that is how you have to see yourself. You are a missionary to bring God's mind, God's heart, God's intentions in whatever you do. So at the end of it all, he will be glorified in your work, in your work of teaching, in your, all your work of education, in your work of healthcare, in your family life, in your work as accounting. So it means that we should remove all the selfishness, the greed, the animosity. They pull him down. All those tendencies must be removed. And the focus should be on his glory. As a father, I must glorify his name in my parenting. As a mother, you glorify God in your motherhood. As an engineer, you glorify God in your engineering work. As a student, you glorify God in your studies. Whatever our hand for it to do, whatever we are involved in, wherever we find ourselves, Jesus remains the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. We are his agents. We are his representatives. We cannot fail. We cannot let him down. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his heart. And he is counting on us to bring glory to him in our workplaces, in our task and assignments, in our responsibilities. Koram Deo. And God bless you. Oh, speak from the heavens and the earth we hear. Oh, speak from the heavens and the earth will hear oh speak from within me and the earth will hear